Hello and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, today we're actually on the road. That's right. Student of the Gun Radio crew is on the road and we are in Ruston, Louisiana. And for those of you who are geographically challenged, Ruston is actually just to the west of Monroe, Louisiana. And uh, all you people who are hip to pop culture or hip to hunting know what comes out of Monroe or West Monroe, right? Well, that's the uh, Duck Commander and Buck Commander line of uh, hunting accessories come from West Monroe. But we're not here because of the Duck Commander, guys. No, no, no. We are in Ruston, Louisiana today because it is, as we record this, the 1st of June. It's the beginning of June, and we're going, as soon as we finish this, put it in the can, we're going to head out to the Red Jacket Firearms Annual Birthday Bash. That's right. It's they We're celebrating Will Hayden's birthday, and, well, if Will Hayden has a birthday, how are you going to celebrate it? Well, obviously... You're going to go out to the range with machine guns and cannons, and that's how you celebrate a birthday. I mean, ask yourself, if you could go out to the range and shoot off a cannon to celebrate your birthday, wouldn't you do it? You know you would. Well, so before we get out to shooting machine guns, we thought we would sit down and we'd put this piece together just for you guys and gals because, hey, that's how much we like you. Now, don't forget, obviously, Student of the Gun is going to take our cameras out there. And uh, very soon, you will be able to see what we did at the Red Jacket Firearms Birthday Bash just by going to studentofthegun.com and watching the show. So keep an eye out for that here in the near future. Now, as always, we want to take a moment to thank and appreciate the folks that let us make this show, the folks that help us make this show possible. And that would be Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. Check them out at KeltecWeapons.com. And also our good friends at Crossbreed Holsters. Now, Crossbreed Holsters is in Liberty, or I'm sorry, not Liberty, Republic, Missouri. Republic, Missouri. And uh, you want to check them out at CrossbreedHolsters.com as well. And, and of course, acknowledgement to our friends at the Firearms Radio Network for being our bandwidth sponsors. Now, as always, we always do a student of the week. And we're getting uh, quite a, a number of student of the week graduates uh, under our belts now. We're going to turn it over to Jared. And Jared is going to tell us who is our student of the week this week. Our student of the week is Kenneth Shaver, and he wants to know what your thoughts on night sights are, such as the Trigicons and XS sights, and do you think they're worth getting on a personal defense weapon? Well, Kenneth, that is a, uh, a great question. That's a question that probably a lot of guys who, uh, who have a concealed carry or home defense gun have asked themselves over the years. And quite frankly, there's been a lot of confusion when it comes to night sights or tritium sights or what have you, because like everything else in the world, we have the new and improved tide formula. We have, you know, when, when uh, tritium sights, let's talk about tritium real quick. Tritium is actually an atomic element. It's a combination of elements uh, with atomic properties, which means what? It produces its own light. It glows green. Okay. Uh, Tritium was actually discovered way back in 1934 by a group of scientists. And one of the first things they used tritium for uh, in a commercial aspect was uh, on watches, you know, aviator watches and so forth, and on dials. And to, and uh, after so many years, somebody said, scratch your head and said, hey, if we can put tritium in watches or on watch faces and it glows and we can see that in the dark, well, why can't we put it on handgun sights? Well, that would be a good idea. Well, they're actually only, because tritium does have atomic properties and because it is a hazardous material, uh, there are only a couple of uh, two companies in the United States of America that produce tritium. That's right. So if you purchase night sites from Excess or Trigicon or, uh, give me another one, Jared, real quick. Uh, you're, you're the ones that come from, you know, the, the Glock factory sites, the Glock factory sites and so forth. Uh, the ones that come from SIG, it, there's, there's only two companies that are actually providing that little green vial of tritium for the manufacturers to put in their sites. Uh, and yes, it does have, so guys are like, yeah, but I heard it has a shelf life. Well, yeah, it does. It, it has a shelf life. I believe there's a, uh, it's a 10 year half life. 
So after five years, it'll start to dim. And then after 10 years, it may need to be replaced. So, all right, guys, you may need to have to replace your front, you know, glow in the dark site once every five to 10 years. So that, that is the downside of tritium. It doesn't last forever. The good side of tritium is that obviously it provides its own energy. So you don't need batteries. Now, when it comes to handguns or any type of firearm, the first thing before we talk about sights, we need to ask ourselves, why do we have sights on a firearm? And you say, well, uh, obviously to hit your target, Paul, then what kind of dumb question is that? No, seriously, think about it like this. Why do we have sights, whether it's an optical sight or whether it's a mechanical sight? Why are those on a firearm? Why are they on a handgun, a rifle, a shotgun? Well, the purpose of sights is to help you align your eye, your dominant shooting eye, with the bore of the barrel. Align it with the bore. And that is the whole purpose. So when you, when you start thinking about sights, you say, well, if, if the purpose of a sight is for me to be able to align my dominant eye with the bore or more uh, the muzzle of the gun. Now, in order to hit your target, you have to have the muzzle in line with the target, correct? Everybody with me? Well, the problem is when you punch that gun out, when you push it away from your body towards your target, you can't see the muzzle <laughs> because it's out in front of you, right? <laughs> So what did they start doing many, many eons ago when they made firearms? Well, they said, hmm, we need to line the muzzle up with the target in order to hit the target. But we can't see the muzzle because it's out in front of us. So what should we do? Well, let's put something right above the muzzle so that we can index it, so that we can see it, we can tell. And the, you know, the original, first original sites were actually they just took a part of the barrel and they, raised it up and made like a little wedge or a little bump. And then they got started getting fancy and they put little brass beads on them, little gold beads on them and so forth until we get to where we are today where there's just innumerable numbers of sight configurations that you can, you know, you've got fiber optics, you've got tritium, you have still gold beads, you have uh, steel ramps with, with uh, you know, fluorescent inserts, orange and green and yellow and white and so forth. But the whole purpose of a front sight on a handgun is to allow you to know exactly where your muzzle is indexed. Where is it pointing? So when it comes to sights, you say, well, what does it have to do with tritium? Well, what it does has to do with tritium is why do we choose to use a tritium type sight? Well, when you punch a handgun out, when you push it out in front of you, there are three things in your vision. You have a rear sight, you have a front sight, and you've got the target. Now, as a homo sapien, as a human being, your eyeball can only focus clearly on one object at a time. You know, but you have three objects at three separate distances out in front of your eyeball. Which one do you need to focus on if you want to hit your target? Well, if, ladies and gentlemen, if you're using mechanical sights, the answer is the front sight. If you want to hit your target every time, all the time, consistently, you need to be able to focus on the front sight. The rear sight will be slightly fuzzy. I mean, it'll be there. It's not going to be gone, but it it's going to be slightly fuzzy. And your target will actually be slightly fuzzy. And that's okay. What you need to be able to see is the front sight. And that's where tritium comes in because they're like, well, how can we make it easier for the human creature for the human being's eyeballs to pick up and find a front sight. Not just when it's a sunny Sunday afternoon, that the conditions are perfect, you know, we're relaxed. You know, if you're shooting on the range, if you're standing on the range, it's a it's 70 degrees. There's no wind. It's like, you know, a couple of white little clouds are dotting the sky. It's perfect conditions. If that's the case, you really don't need tritium sights. Just use a standard steel blacked out sight and you'll be good to go because you have all the time in the world to find your front sight, to focus on it, and to press your trigger. 
That's not the case when you're fighting with a gun in your hand. If you find yourself with a handgun in your paw and there's a bad person attempting to do you harm, that is not a sunny Sunday afternoon on the square range. That is 11 o'clock on a Friday night in a dark parking lot. That's in the hallway of your house after you heard the window break and the dogs bark and it's 2 a.m. That is when you need to be able to find that site quick, fast, and in a hurry. How long do you have to find that front site and press the trigger? Maybe the rest of your life. Now, the rest of your life might be three seconds or it might be 30 years, depending on what you do in that moment in time. And that is the whole purpose behind tritium sights, is to be able to pick up your sight in all light conditions, not just perfect light conditions, but all light conditions. Because, you know, statistically, most hostile assaults or hostile attacks occur in air in times of poor light, whether it's actually nighttime, whether it's indoors, um, Situations where the light is less than perfect. Well, what do human beings need? What do, you, what do your eyeballs need to find objects? What do you need to see? You need light, right? That's how your eyeballs work. They work with the available light. So if the light is poor and your eyes have less to work with, hence tritium sites. Now, which sites are available right now? You have a company called MeproLite. Uh, you've got Trigicon itself, the actual Trigicon company. Just about every manufacturer of handguns in the United States offers as an add-on what they call night sights. You know, they call them night sights, whether it's Glock or Sig or Smith & Wesson or, you know, uh, Springfield Armory or Ruger, you name it. They have some form of night sights. And, of course, you have XS Sites Corporation. Now, what makes XS Sites a little bit different, uh, they have what they call the Express Site or the 24-7 Express Site. And what a 24-7 Site is essentially is it's a big white dot with a green tritium insert. And a lot of folks get really bunged up. It, it, it amazes me how in the year 2013, when XS has been in business, I believe since... I'm going to say 97, 95. It, it's been since the 90s, the mid-90s, that they've been in business. They've gone through a couple of name changes. They were first um, uh, Ashley Express Sites and so forth. Well, XS Sites in their current configuration, they offer lots of different site configurations for rifles and shotguns and handguns, but their most popular one is the 24-7 Express Site, and the front site is a big dot. Now, it's not, when I say big dot, it's like, what, an eighth of an inch across or something. It's not like it's, it's not the size of the cap on your Coke bottle. I mean, it's not that big. But uh, what they've done is, and it's actually pretty ingenious, is they, they took the concept of using a bead or a dot and expanded upon that. Now, the if you guys know anything about history or hunting or big game hunting, what they used to put was essentially white marble type uh, sights on front of big game rifles, on express rifles. So a lion is coming to eat you and you need to throw your rifle up, find the front sight, press the trigger before you get eaten. Okay, bam. Why do they use a dot or a, you know, a sphere or a bead. Well, because the bead has a greater surface area with which to reflect light. More light gets reflected off of a, uh, a convex bead or a marble type object than does a flat object. It's just simple physics. It's, that's the way, I don't even know if physics is the correct word, but that's that's how it works. More light is reflected off of that bead than it would be if it was just flat. And a lot, and most people just gloss right over that fact. They don't, they don't understand that fact that they don't understand that's why the big dot is designed like that. It has a white dot that is actually convex and it reflects more light than a standard flat sight would. And what they did for the express sites. So you can get the plain ones. You can get the ones without tritium in them. But the uh, the most popular ones have a tritium insert. So what does the 24-7 site do? It gives you a reference point 
in all light conditions. Good light conditions, poor light conditions, half light, you know, you're in a building and there's heavy shadows between you and what, you know, is trying to hurt you. Uh, you got your back lit, your front lit, uh, starlight, what have you, that gives you a reference point. And that's what you need. If you want to be able to hit your target when you need to hit it really quick, fast, in a hurry, you need to be able to find a front sight of some sort. Now, I know that there are guys out there that are listening to me that are going to give me the whole instinctive shooting, point shooting, you don't need sights. I read a book by Ed McGivern in 1957 that says you don't need to. All right. Fantastic. Rock on. Drive on with your bad self. But here's what I'm going to tell you the the way the real world is. If you stand on a range and you practice, you plant your feet and you practice drawing and pointing and hitting a target and you do it over and over and over again, yes, indeed, you can, quote, unquote, instinctive shoot. You can figure out, you can hit the bullseye. But what is what is a big part of that situation or that equation is you standing in the same position all the time and aligning your body in the same way all the time. That's not how it works in the real world. If someone is trying to kill you, kill your wife, kill your child, break into your house, smash through your front door, do you believe that you're going to have the opportunity to stand in that perfect stance, that natural body alignment stance that you practice on the range so many times? What do you do if you're knocked on your butt? If you're laying on the ground with your left arm all crumbled up because you fell into the asphalt and you broke your left wrist, all you have is your right hand and you're punching your gun up towards the person. Is that the time to try and master your instinctive shooting technique? Or the person, you have to come up out of a chair or you're in a seated position or you have to shoot over an object or a round cover. You know, all these guys that have a perfect shooting position on the square range. Uh, what happens when there's cover between, and there should be cover if you're a smart person, between you and the bad guy? How do you use that perfect shooting stance and lean around cover or lay on the ground and shoot around cover? The answer is you don't. You need to have something on the front of that gun that you can index on the target, press the trigger, make bad guys stop being bad. So the answer to your question, Kenneth, is yes, do I think tritium sights on a fighting handgun are a good idea? Absolutely. All of my fighting handguns, uh, when I was working as a police officer uh, and then as a professional bodyguard uh, and just uh, protecting myself with a concealed carry, all of my fighting guns have excess sights on them. And they have for, I don't know, since 1997, 1998. Now, here is the caveat, and I'm going to give you this caveat because I like you guys and I always like to give you something to think about. What is the most important object for you to see? Well, we talked about that. It's the front sight. The problem that that I have with a lot of sight of uh, tritium sight makers is what they'll do is they'll put one vial of tritium in the front sight. Then they'll take two vials of tritium, put it in the rear sight. And they're like, oh, you get three little dots. Okay, rock on. That's that's wonderful. But. What is the most important object for you to pick up and see clearly, clearly and focus on? Well, it's the front sight, right? If you put twice as much tritium in the rear sight as you do in the front, and naturally, because of the way, you know, physics, when you punch the gun out, the rear sight is physically closer to your eyes than the front sight is, where do you think your eye will naturally go first? Well, if you're a normal human being, your eye is going to go to the brightest spot first. And if you put twice as much tritium in the rear as in the front and you put the rear sight closer to the your eyes, which obviously it is, your eyes are going to go immediately first to the rear sight. And then you're going to say, no, that's the rear sight. I need to look through that and I need to find the front sight. Okay, there's the front sight. Now I have them aligned. Now I can press the trigger. Do you really want to take that time? Do you really think it's a good idea taking that time? Uh, I personally don't. If I have uh, if I have a gun, if I'm loaned a gun or issued a gun that has double tritium rear and single tritium front, what I will do is I'll take a black marker and I'll go over the back of it 
because I don't want to have to play that half second. Where's the front sight? Where's the rear? You know, which one is the front? Which one is the rear game? Not a good game to be playing when your life is on the line. So that is my only caveat with tritium uh, uh, sights. And you say, well, and, well, why do, if if that's the case, Paul, why do manufacturers make them that way? <laughs> that's a topic for another show. <laughs> All right, so we talked about tritium sights and that, yes, I do believe that they are a good idea on a fighting gun, especially the excess big dot sights because, you know, if if God hates you and you woke up in the morning and your tritium has gone dead, you still have a great big white bead to find. So I want to um, take a moment to revisit our friends or revisit uh, the uh, the top topic of helping our friends at the 4-H shooting sports program. Now, right now, as we uh, record this, it is the very, very beginning of June, and uh, it's going to be camp season. It's going to be shooting season for these kids all across the nation. And our good friends up at the Ohio 4-H shooting sports are getting ready to put on two shooting education camps, a youth, uh, a, uh, a junior camp, and a senior camp. Now, the senior camp isn't actually until the third week of July. So we still got, uh, you know, six, seven weeks before that camp kicks off. But I want to strongly encourage you, uh, ladies and gentlemen out there in the audience, if you believe that young people, that adults in training are the future of this nation, that they are the future of the American shooting sports or the American shooting culture. And I don't know how you could deny that, but you know, they are young people are the future of our culture. If you want to help those folks out, contact Larry Harris, the Ohio shooting sports coordinator and tell them you'd like to uh, don't make a donation. You'd like to donate some ammunition to them. They can still use 22 long rifle. If if you're sitting on a you know a war stock at 10,000 rounds of 22, they could use a little bit of it. Jared, what's up? Well, and it's not just the the shooting sports world. The 4-H camp teaches the kids a lot of discipline, and they'll carry on throughout their entire life. Jared is absolutely right. Uh, the 4-H shooting sports program is not just about shooting. It's about youth development. It's about helping these kids and giving them the skills they need to be productive citizens. And I think right now everyone out there in the listening audience will agree with me that what we need more of in the United States of America is productive, responsible, mature citizens. The last thing we need is is, is more people just sucking on the government teat. So, uh if you have the opportunity, if you you know, if I've inspired you, uh, we're going to put the link up for you as always on the Student of the Gun Radio page, and you can contact Larry Harris, the Ohio 4-H Shooting Sports Coordinator. Uh, send him an email, give him a call, say, "Hey, Larry, I heard you, I heard about you on uh, Student of the Gun Radio, and I want to help you out. What can I do?" And he will be glad to uh, accept any assistance that you can give him. We've got some really good news coming out of the Republic of Texas. We actually have two stories that we want to talk about this week. And the first one is about the legislation that Governor Perry has just signed or is about to sign authorizing teachers to be trained as armed marshals to protect students in schools. And the, according to the story, it says uh, go, the bill is on it. The bill has been passed by the House and the Senate. It's on its way to the governor's desk, and the governor has declared that he is going to indeed sign it. So, for those of us that are responsible adults in the United States of America who believe that we need to protect our children with something other than shiny signs and stickers to put on the doors, uh, I believe that's a step in the right direction. And it's about training, too. It's not just about telling the local uh, gym teacher, yeah, go ahead and, and bring your Roscoe to school tomorrow. No, it's not it. It's about making sure that these people who are designated uh, armed marshals in the schools, that they have the training that they need, and that's fantastic. And when it comes to arming teachers or arming school staff or arming school officials, uh, there's there's been a lot of contention, a lot of pushback in, in the media. And people are like, well, that just makes the problem worse. Or we, we can't risk having guns 
in the schools because the gun itself, you know, it's almost as if people are so naive that they believe, well, you know, if Mr. Jenkins comes to school with a gun and little Johnny Snotnose in his first period English class makes him mad, he's just going to whip out his Roscoe and, and kill Johnny. Really? I mean, do, do you think the people that are teaching your kids are that unstable? Uh, if they're that unstable, I don't think passing an armed martial um uh, program is going to make them more unstable. We we live in an era right now, it's a sad era that we live in, and, and but we have to deal with the times. We have to deal with the reality of it. And the reality of the fact is, is you cannot sterilize the world. I've been saying this for at least a decade. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot sterilize the world as much as we may desire to, as much as we may want to sterilize the world. You can't do it. I'll give you a fantastic example. Maximum security prisons. Okay. A maximum security prison where even the guards that walk around are not allowed to be armed. You would think that that would be the safest place on planet Earth. It would be the most weapon-free place and violence-free place on the planet. Well, guess what? Every single time they have a syllable, they have what they call a shakedown. They pull everybody out of their cells and they send in the teams and they search them. Every time, and I know a lot of corrections officers, both in the state and federal system, every time they do that, they come up with weapons. Every time. And you say, if we cannot keep weapons out of a maximum security prison, how in the world do you expect to keep weapons out of the hands of citizens that are just moving about day to day out of a, out of a school? If you can't keep a maximum security prison free of weapons, how do you expect to keep a school or a campus or a restaurant or a post office or a bank? How do you think you're going to keep that free of weapons? Well, you're not. And what we need to not be so concerned with is objects, instead of focusing on objects, why don't we focus on the actual evil creatures that are committing those deeds? You're not ever going to be able to stop evil people from being evil. You can't stop them. You can't get into their hearts and minds and change them. But what you can do is you can prepare yourself to deal with that evil creature. And it's not by trying to sterilize your world. It's impossible. It's it's a panacea. It's a fantasy. It's like um, absolute safety. People are always seeking absolute safety. If you get out of bed in the morning, you have just erased an, any and all hopes of having absolute safety. The best you can hope for is to be prepared. Now, as ugly and as nasty as the topic is, if a bad person with a weapon enters a school and start begins to harm or threatens to harm people, what is the best method to stop that person or to inhibit their ability to harm a child? It's not with a shiny sign or a placard or a camera or any other thing, it's a good person, and I know I'm, I'm paraphrasing the NRA and Wayne LaPierre, but it is a good person with a gun, a, a trained, you know, good guy with a gun is the surest way to stop a bad person with a, you know, bad intentions. And you say, well, how about tasers and how about this and how about that? We went through this after 9-11. Folks, we went through this, and it amazes me how what a bunch of slow learners we are. And it's almost as if we are, as a society, willful slow learners. After 9-11, we started playing these, these half-measures games because everyone was afraid to let pilots have guns or to put armed marshals on planes. We can't do that. We can't do that. That's, that just makes things worse. Well, if, you know... Johnny Haji gets on a plane and he's got knives or box cutters or, or God forbid, a gun, and you have a taser, guess what? You lose. Um, knife trumps taser. Gun trumps taser. And they say, well, let, we'll just armor. Uh, all the cockpits will have armored doors. Okay, fantastic. But here's the reality of it. As somebody who's provided professional security his entire life, adult life, whether as a United States Marine, as a police officer, as a professional bodyguard, I can tell you this. It doesn't matter how armored the cockpit door is. If it can be opened, 
it will be opened. Well, what do you mean, Paul? That's bull crap. No, they, the, the policy says they lock it during flight and they never will open it. All right. Let me put one to you this way. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, let's take the, the cockpit door out and let's put a locked school door. All right. You have a locked door of a classroom or locked door of an office or locked door in, in a hallway. And the bad person has an innocent person in their hand and they say, unlock this door or I will kill this child. And you say, no, our policy forbids it. They kill the child, grab another child, unlock the door. I kill this child. How long do you think it's going to take them to unlock that door? They're going to. If a door can be can be opened, it can be breached. If a person can get into a building, if a human could get inside, they can they will get inside. And the question you have to ask yourself is in, you know, the most horrible situation, what could we do? And the answer is simple. It's you know, the Israelis figured this out 30 40 years ago. When the Palestinian terrorists and the Arabic terrorists started killing Israeli school children, what did they do? They had volunteer adults, volunteer parents, and armed staff. Every time an Israeli group of children goes out on a, on a field trip, you have teachers and school officials and armed parent chaperones that are, you know, that have guns, that have actual guns with them. Well, guess what? The bad guys don't want to get into a gun battle with you. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is to commit as much horror as possible until the good guys with the guns show up. Well, if the good guys with the guns are already there, there will be a minimum amount of horror, not a maximum amount of horror. And for one, I applaud Governor Perry. Uh, for signing this legislation and moving it forward. Now, our next story out of Texas is not a uh, necessarily a gun-related story, but it's another story about how the Republic of Texas has taken steps in moving forward to keep people, to protect the citizen, not the government employee, but to actually protect the citizen. And this story uh, is a, another vote. It says, Governor Rick Perry votes vetoes a threat to liberty. And what we had essentially was a bill that was put forth that would require the reporting of all of the names and affiliations of political donors. And uh, and what Rick Perry said was this, and I'll give you the exact quote from the governor. Freedom of association and freedom of speech are two of the most important rights enshrined in the Constitution. My fear is that Senate Bill 346 would have a chilling effect on both of those rights in our democratic political process. And it says, while, it says, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, while regulation is necessary in the administration of Texas political finance laws, no regulation is tolerable that puts anyone's participation at risk or that can be used by a government organization or an individual to intimidate those who choose to participate in the political process. And what does that mean to us? Well, what it means is that Rick Perry is smart enough to understand that right now in the United States of America, there are people in the United States government that are attempting to intimidate those who oppose them. Don't believe me? Read a paper. Google it. Get on the Internet. The IRS, We're and as this, uh, you know, as this, ball of twine uh, unravels we're finding it wasn't just a few organizations it was a huge number of organizations and and they're also finding out that there may have been individual citizens who supported conservative causes or limited government causes or constitutional causes that were being singled out for audits and intimidation by the IRS now who is the IRS oh the Internal Revenue Service well who runs them the federal government. So what Rick Perry said is, no, we're not turning over all the names of political donors to the to Big Brother so that Big Brother can decide whether or not to intimidate them or whether or not to put the pressure of the federal government on them. And uh, I applaud Governor Perry for that. You know, Jared and I actually, uh, we got to at NRA in Houston. Uh, we were doing a book signing at the Excess Sites booth. Did we mention this on the radio, Jared? I don't think we did. But uh, we were doing a book signing at the Excess Sites booth. And uh, Excess is from Texas. They're from Fort Worth. And uh, Governor came by and he stopped at the booth. 
Uh, he stopped by the booth and he, he thanked uh, everybody uh, from Excess for coming to Houston and supporting the Texas economy and for operating a business in the uh, Republic of Texas. And uh, it was really cool. He we, you know he th- thanked everyone and shook their hands and then he said, "Oh, let's pose for a picture." So uh, you know we we cheesed it up for a picture and uh, uh, his aide was right there and and uh, uh, my partner said, "Well, would the governor like a book?" And he's like, "Sure." He you know the governor loves guns, so we signed a, a student of the copy of student of the gun for the governor. It was it was kind of a cool. It was a little bit of a kind of a whirlwind. It just blew in, did a thing, and blew out. But uh, it, it was really uh, gratifying, and we had a great time down there in Houston, um, in Texas. So. I suppose that what I'm probably doing right now on the radio is increasing the uh, encouraging people to move to <laughs> to move to Texas. Now, speaking of student of the gun, don't forget, guys. Now, our student of the week, and I didn't mention this earlier, but when we pick a student of the week, if your question is picked, what we're gonna what we'll do is we'll send you an official student of the gun T-shirt as a way of saying thanks for participating, and you don't have to wait. <laughs> you don't have to wait to be picked as the student of the week. If you want a student of the gun shirt, just go to student of the gun.com go to student of the gun gear.com. You can get yourself an official shirt. Uh, you can get a signed copy of the book. All of our, of our really cool student of the gun gear is there. So uh, don't be shy. Don't be afraid to get on there. This story is uh, the, the source is Atlas shrug 2000. Dot com and it says Minnesota Muslim mob attacks randomly attacks joggers and uh, essentially it said a, a group of young Muslim men uh, have been attacking people that they think are homosexual women in public and so forth in the United States of America on a public street a public park in the United States of America we have groups of Muslim immigrants attacking citizens. Ask yourself this. We're going to put the link up for you. You know, don't just take my word for it. Go to studentofthegunradio.com and check out the link. But uh, why is it that CNBC hasn't told you about this? Why is it that MSNBC hasn't told you about this? CNN, your local affiliate. Are you hearing about this for the very first time from me? And that's the first question you need to ask yourself is why is that? Why is this being hidden from me? Is there an agenda that they have where they don't want me to know about this? Well, thank God for the Internet, or you probably wouldn't know about it. But the big question is this, and and as a student of the gun, you need to ask yourself. And I I had somebody say, well, all right, I'm jogging, and I'm in my shorts and T-shirt, my little, you know, my kids. (laughs) All right, my, my Nikes or whatever. And uh, mine and my own business, and, and here comes a group of individuals, and they attack me. What am I supposed to do, Paul? I don't know. What are you going to do? When you walk out of your house, do you anticipate that because you're, uh, you want to, you know, jog you say well i'm going to participate in the activity of jogging and because i'm going to do that that gives me a pass or a waiver uh on physical assault or attack no one will attack me while i'm in the process of jogging because that would be unfair uh the world isn't fair ladies and gentlemen so we said well what am i supposed to do am i supposed to carry a gun while i'm jogging i don't know are you is there a way you could do that would it be lawful? Could you carry something else? There's actually several companies that, that make uh, little hand uh, elastic hand holsters because obviously when you're running, you don't like to have stuff banging against you. I know that. But uh, OC Pepper Spray, there are companies that make these little elastic hand holsters that you slip on over the palm of your hand and you can carry OC. And if for no other reason than, you know, a vicious dog comes running up to you while you're running, you can give him the juice and he'll stop misbehaving and go away. And no, OC won't kill a dog, but it will make him not want to bite you. It'll make him go away and do other stuff. It works very, very well. Now let's, let's go to the gravest extreme. You, you and you, either you alone or you and a friend or what have you are jogging and two, three, four, five people attack you and start beating you 
They're pummeling you, kicking you, stopping you, punching you. And you say, but they're unarmed. And even if I had a gun, I, I couldn't use it. Er, stop. Here's something you need to understand. There is a factor in use of force. Now, remember, we've talked pr- previously about this. We've talked about deadly force and less than lethal force or non-lethal force. Now, when it comes to the use of deadly force, you have to, before you can legally use deadly force, you have to meet certain criteria, and we've talked about them here. But there's also a situation called disparity of force. And what is that, Paul? Well, disparity of force essentially is this. Do the courts recognize or understand that a 92-pound female when attacked by a 250-pound male, even though he doesn't have a gun or a knife in his hand, does he potentially pose a deadly force threat to that person? Well, generally, the answer is yes. And why is the answer yes? The answer is yes because of what they call a disparity. What is a disparity? It means a difference. If the disparity is in favor of the attacker, you as a citizen, you as the victim, have the lawful right to increase your use of force. Let me put it to you this way. Two, the courts recognize that two or more attackers attacking a single individual, though they may not be technically armed with objects such as knives or clubs or what have you, can in fact do deadly force, can inflict, now what is deadly force? Death and or serious bodily harm. So if two or two, let's say two, three guys, three guys jump you in a parking lot, their hands are empty. They don't have any bats or bottles or bricks or anything. They start pummeling you. Do the courts believe that you should just sit there and take it? Or maybe you should have studied harder in jujitsu or, you know, gotten your black belt in karate and, you know, been Chuck Norris's, you know, uh, not mentor, his uh, disciple. Uh, No, they recognize that three people with empty hands can do serious bodily harm and or death to an individual, a lone attacker. And because of that, you are lawfully allowed to use a greater amount of force than would be normal if it was just you and one adult male and another adult male. Uh, disparity of force also not, it doesn't just apply to numbers. It applies to sex. It applies to age. It applies to physical handicap. You know, the courts understand that if you have to walk with a cane because of a spinal injury, that you're not you're not expected to duke it out with a crackhead in a parking lot. They expect that because there is a disparity of force in favor of the attacker. And how do you close that disparity? How do you close that gap? Well, you close that gap by using a weapon, and generally it is a handgun or a firearm. So the truth of the matter is, from a legal standpoint, if you are attacked by three people, although they may have empty hands, they're pummeling you. The courts understand that if you don't stop them, they can do deadly force to you. How do you stop them? Well, how do you stop homo sapiens from committing deadly force against you? You insert projectiles into their upper torso area until they stop trying to harm you. And when they stop, you stop. Now, all of this, that you know, and that's a big conundrum that a lot of people are like, well, yeah, it wouldn't matter anyway, because, you know, even if I had a gun, you know, unless I saw that they had a knife or a weapon, I couldn't use it. Brother, if you're going to lay on the ground and let three dudes stomp your head into the ground or pummel you mercilessly because you're afraid to use your firearm to defend yourself, you haven't gotten the proper amount of training. You have not gotten the proper amount of information. And you need to get that information. You need to get that training. And you need to understand all these things that we're talking about here. That's why we're talking about them now. While you're driving in your car, you're on the treadmill, you know, you're doing what you got one earbud in as you're sitting at your desk at work. I know who you are. I know you guys are out there. But uh, and you know, the, the boss isn't looking. Put your earbuds in. You can listen to Paul Markle for a little bit. But 
the reason we're talking about this right now is because in the heat of a an attack, in the heat of an assault, you don't have time to sit down and, and apply analytical thinking and reason it out. If you have not considered the dangers and what you will do in that danger beforehand, you're just going to be making it up and you're probably going to make it up wrong. What you need to do is you need to make the mental decision and the mental commitment beforehand. Not after, but beforehand, this is what I'm going to do. If I'm ever in this situation and it materializes and it becomes you know, a deadly force situation, this is what I'm allowed to do. And that's where a lot of people get in trouble. A lot of victims end up being victimized and harmed because even though they could have taken steps to preserve their own life, they don't because they're afraid, because they don't know what they're allowed to do. Well, if I do that, then I'll be in trouble or it'll be illegal or I'll go to jail too, what have you. And, and people will do that. They'll hesitate because they don't understand what their lawful rights are and they end up becoming victimized. That's why we take this time right now, whether you're treadmill driving, sitting at your desk at work to talk about these things. Now, in this show, we can't go into each and every single detail of justifiable use of force. And you know, I've been answering these questions for, you know, what, 10, 15, 20 years now. And that's one of the reasons that, that we sat down and we filmed the Arm Living DVD. We did the DVD, and not only we talk about how to shoot, we talk about when you should shoot, and we talk about the what now. And those big three, the how, when, and what now, are what you need to understand before you ever find yourself with a gun in your hand, you need to have clarity of mind. And that's why we put that DVD together to pr provide you with all that information. Now, a DVD is not a substitute for training. A DVD is used to uh, enhance your training or to enhance your existing knowledge. And uh, obviously, you guys you guys know that you can check that out at studentofthegun.com, student of the gun gear, all that good stuff. Now, we want to thank you guys for joining us again. Uh, we're very, we're just more pleased than we can let you know that we have this opportunity to bring this information to everybody out there in the audience. I want to thank Jared for being behind the board and working hard today. And uh, he's itching. Are you itching, Jared? I am itching. He's itching. He he wants to get out and get a machine gun in his hand. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to tell you guys not to forget that you are a beginner once, but you should be a student for life. And we're going to go shoot machine guns. <laughs>